And the 2013 Morris F. Cullen Award goes to Dr. Peter Solovich of MIT. <laughs> well, I was shocked. Uh, you know, it's one of these awards where you don't know that you're in the running, so it's not like you're hanging on waiting for the Academy to call. Uh, and Alexa called me and, uh, uh, and, and told me that, and I was delighted. I was frankly surprised. Pete's a marvelous choice for this award. He uh, uh, has been contributing to the field really since the 1970s, uh, and in a unique way, and I think that's part of what makes it especially appropriate that, that he be selected for this award. About time. You know, Pete, Pete has been such a powerful force in this field for, for so many years. I was tickled to, to see that he, he was now the winner this year. Peter Solovich was born in Hungary, December 21st, 1948. I come from a Jewish family, and um, my parents uh, were both survivors of the Holocaust. My mother was deported from Hungary in 1944 to Auschwitz and um, fortunately was not selected to be exterminated. My dad was a shoemaker from a long line of shoemakers and rabbis. That was the, those were the family professions. And um, uh, he was in a labor camp during the Second World War. Peace mother and father were both married to other spouses before the Second World War, but her husband and his wife and son died in the Holocaust. My mother's husband and my father's wife were first cousins which is how my parents had met originally. And so they got together after the war, got married in 1947, and I came along uh, in 1948. Um, so that's how I came to be. Life was not easy in Hungary under communist rule after the war, but... Actually, there was an amusing story that I was just reminded of. Uh, my birthday is the same as Joseph Stalin's birthday. <laughs> And so apparently the village where we were living when I was one year old was electrified and the, the lights were turned on in honor of Stalin's birthday. And my parents always told me that I was so conceited that I thought that it was in honor of my birthday. <laughs> and I got very excited over this. The chaos of the Hungarian Revolution in 1956 provided a chance for Peter's family to escape from Hungary. And we wound up in Vienna where we went to the American Embassy and said, let us in, we're dying to go to the U.S. And the Americans said, well, not this month, come back next month and ask again. And we did that for two years, and eventually they said, yes, <laughs> this month you can come. So in January 1959, Pete and his mom and dad began their new life in Los Angeles. And what followed could not possibly be in greater contrast to what had come before it. I think early on I, I knew I wanted to be a scientist. Um, so I was gonna be a physicist or an astrophysicist or something like that. But as a high schooler, Pete attended a science camp sponsored by the National Science Foundation and was introduced to computers. I enjoyed programming, I enjoyed math, I enjoyed physics, and then I went to Caltech and actually majored in physics. But for his PhD, Pete switched to computer science. Went to Caltech as an undergraduate, stayed there as a graduate student, got my PhD there, and then was lucky enough to get a nice job at MIT, and I've been there ever since. Simple career. <laughs> it's a one-line CV. <laughs> when Pete arrived at MIT, he brought a PhD that was gained working on knowledge representation and inference problems. But young Dr. Solovich discovered a group of MDs who were trying to understand medical reasoning. So he hooked up with them and found his way into medical informatics. I remember just around Christmas time in 1974, Bill Schwartz, who was chief of medicine at Tufts, and Steve Pauker, who became a longtime collaborator, uh, showed up at my office and dumped a copy of Harrison's textbook of medicine on my desk. And I picked up my copy of Harrison's which at that point was a single volume, about five inches thick. I threw it at him. I said, Peter, learn that and come back when you're done. And he did. 
And that's exactly what Pete did, read Harrison's in one month and went back to talk. And they said, oh, nobody reads Harrison's. <laughs> Um, but that's how I got my start in the field. And, and then I figured it would take me 10 years to solve all the problems. And 10 years came and went, and there were still plenty of interesting problems left to work on. So I continued to work in it. Went on rounds with uh, Pete, uh, Steve Pauker and uh, Jerry Kassir, Bill Schwartz. These were the three people I think that most influenced his uh, learning about medicine. And, and that's pretty good exposure to medicine because those folks are clear clinical leaders as well as deep thinkers about um, information and knowledge processing and how decisions are made and the like, and that's been very much Pete's area. In 1975, shortly after immersing himself into medicine and biomedical informatics, Pete first met longtime friend and colleague Kasimir Kulikowski at an artificial intelligence medicine workshop at Rutgers. I feel that it was an occasion where we were able to bond very much through late night discussions, not only about the technical and medical problems, but also finding out that our families shared some parallel horrifying experiences during World War II, which made us realize just how lucky we are to be in the United States to be able to work on exciting scientific and technological problems. You go to a meeting that might be contentious, you'd like him to be there. He's like calming oil on waters, and you just feel comfortable around Peter. Everybody feels comfortable around Peter, and he always has sensible things and sensible perspectives in whatever is going on. Uh, he's hot. Everyone likes him. Peter is an extraordinary uh, individual. He's amazingly creative. He's amazingly insightful, and I can't imagine anyone who is more deserving of this award. Peter. As might be expected, Pete Solovich is virtually woven into the very fabric of MIT and renowned for the help he gives his graduate students no matter how difficult. If he's got a, a, a graduate student, he's going to help him to the extreme to, to, get the, to get him successful or her successful. And I heard stories of some very difficult ones that he's worked with uh, and, and, and succeeded. Uh, he'll, he'll go to any length. He's very, very, he's a good person. It's very interesting, you know, my first three graduate students, uh, I think one of them was the same age I was and one of them was about a year older and one of them was younger. And so I remember when we got together, I would say, well, look guys, I I'm just as new to this field <laughs> as you are. I don't know a whole lot more, but there are some really fascinating problems here and so let's work together to figure them out. And that was just a great environment, uh, a great way of, of operating. It's a little harder for me to pull that off today because of all the white hair. Uh, <laughs> they somehow don't think of me as their age anymore. <laughs> He's able to explain to anyone, even me, the complexities of mathematics and computer science in these designs and just does an absolutely bang up job. So I can only hope that I'll have time and energy to teach another dozen or hundred people. And uh, I'll keep trying to understand what he's saying. The extent to which Dr. Solovich gives of himself is so well known that no one is surprised when his own personal stories become a vehicle for teaching and perspective. You have shared with us your own difficulties and suffering after your heart surgery, during and after your heart surgery and as you went into it. And that helps us understand exactly how difficult it is to be a patient going through these experiences, while at the same time giving us a unique benefit from your own scientific background and your ability to present a detached and somewhat even humorous take on what it takes to go through the more of the medical surgical system. The laser-like focus that Pete brings to a lecture or symposium is also legendary. Just ask Amy a leadership. He is the guy who wants to go with the proceedings open on his lap while he hears a talk at the AMIA meeting. In fact, the AMIA leadership has heard from him about what's happened when they move to electronic form of the proceedings because he misses that sense of being able to be reading 
the paper, understanding it in greater depth while he's listening to the talk. And his ability and his, his eagerness uh, to get that understanding of what's going on clearly makes him uh, an unusually uh, perceptive and broad uh, contributor uh, to the field. He's sort of a renaissance man in a lot of ways in, in this. He's, he's touched many different parts of medical informatics, uh, natural language processing, interpretation of text, de-identification, decision support, um, genomics, and medical data together. Pete's current and ongoing research focuses in part on developing machine learning models that can predict upcoming changes in a patient's state and timely therapeutic opportunities from data about tens of thousands of past intensive care patients and developing a scalable informatics framework that will bridge clinical research data and the vast data banks arising from basic science research in order to better understand the genetic bases of complex diseases. Ordinary transactions is a nothing. Artificial intelligence is tough and good. And he's a great practitioner. On the personal side of the ledger, Pete and wife Diane have been a couple since their college days. Well, my wife was a young, young lady that I met in Southern California and then persuaded to uh, leave UCLA and come with me to Boston when I moved to MIT. And uh, she finished her bachelor's degree at Boston University and then eventually got a law degree and became a lawyer. And then uh, in 1984, we had a daughter and in 86, a son. Uh, they're both artists. Uh, so my daughter is a theater director in, in New York City, and my son is a screenwriter in Hollywood. To a certain extent, Pete will always now be called a uh, Colin Award winner, and I think that will reverberate nicely, and he'll like that. Uh, but, but fundamentally, Pete's going to be Pete, and he's going to continue to do, I know, the, the things that he loves and, and will be the ways in which he will continue to contribute to the field as he always has. Peter, I think it is extraordinarily well deserved. It is yet another capstone in your career. I must say that it's a truly an honor and a pleasure to be able to say how much I appreciate you as a wonderful colleague for over 40 years and as a friend and be able to say how happy I am to be, to be here with you and see you receive this recognition of your outstanding achievements in medical informatics through the Colin Award. I hope we'll be able to share many more adventures in medical informatics for many more years to come. I was thinking, gee, it's just about time. There's a wonderful guy who's been a friend of mine in NLM for all these many years, great contributor to work in medical artificial intelligence. Even when other people abandon the field, he's stuck with it. And gosh, I'm, I'm glad that he's going to get this nice award. And as we focus upon this 2013 Morris F. Collin Award and its recipient, Peter Solovich, it is with great joy and reverence that we celebrate the 100th birthday of the man himself, Maury Collin, born November 12, 1913. Yes, that's 11, 12, 13. And he's still going strong. Marvelous person, we're lucky his life has been preserved and uh, his attitude is as positive now as it ever was. I mean, he just rolls along, takes the good with the bad and persists. And I wouldn't say narrow is his focus, but he, uh, he, he is capable, fully capable of focusing on things that are realistic and doable with effort.